into the normal wages, which is obviously, I believe, is a very good idea. But in terms of Fenty just being unwanted unmo at the moment and spending restrictions coming in next year because of the EU, EU rules, uh, in terms of how they sell that to the public, there's obviously a, f a far greater amount of people working in the private sector than there is in the public sector. So there's that type of opinion, I suppose, a generalisation that public sector workers probably have a, have have more secure conditions than private sector workers. So in terms of, I suppose, how you sell the living wage, how 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 you term it in your the manifesto, should be a crucial thing for the strategists and the and the, the, the people designing your strategies for the election. That that's how I'd see it. A certain way you can sell it, but it has to be yeah. sold as yeah. well. Okay, it's very yeah. careful. Yeah, very briefly, yeah. Yeah. Very you know, obviously we should watch out uh, you know, because there's those who would exploit the, the concept of the, the delusory of being a public sector worker. You just don't want to work in, in negative effect, even though yeah. you're trying to put a positive policy sure. forward. Yeah. You know? And I think it's also important to remember that, it's, for me as a politician, it, it's deeply embarrassing uh, when one hears statistics about uh, maybe soldiers in the Irish Army. Mm having to depend on family income supplement. Um, you know, there are lots of public sector workers mm. in key areas uh, yeah. where it hasn't been alleged, I haven't studied the figures, but I certainly know that soldiers have been mentioned. And mm. if we have soldiers on an income level that's so low that it depends at the top of uh, uh, like family income supplement, then I think it would be shameful for the government uh, not to at least address those key workers in, 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 in such a low, low paid appointment. I think just my point there is just that you have to you have to you have to punch clever in terms of yeah, reaching yeah, reaching point. your objectives. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, no, I think the point yeah. absolutely that's a very fair point. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um I, I think the values that we share in the labour movement of like fairness, justice, equality are you know, they're very compelling values, but I think both sides of the movement are but I'll speak for the trade union movement right now. Um, struggle sometimes to communicate those values to um, people that aren't as engaged as the people in this room, I'll put it that way. So while, while he, we in SIPTU regularly acknowledge the role that Labour and Government has played in reinstating the infrastructure for workers' rights, um, it is actually quite difficult to explain in a soundbite to someone the benefits to them of having collective bargaining mm. legislation. Um, people find the EROs, REAs, SEOs, that's jargon to a lot of people. Um, we, we're talking here about how we organise low paid and migrant workers and we're going to do a course for people on sit to jargon. You know, to, just to, just I'm going to take it. I'm going to do the advanced course of myself. I start to understand some of this stuff. But sometimes the way we speak to each other in these yeah. kind of rooms is not compelling to. I don't really like the term myself, but ordinary people. But the thing about the living wage, I think, and and I tried to make those comments at this at the start of my speech, is it does connect with people. People get the concept of a living wage. And there are 400,000 people in the Republic of Ireland who live under the low threshold. They're your target um, for a living wage. But I, I absolutely agree with you. In the trade union movement, we're often pegged as vested interest and only representing the interests of public sector workers. That's very far from the truth in this union. But the media don't really care about that. They, they just want to keep things simple. you know. So I, I think you're absolutely I, right. I, I think it's just crucial that how 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 like how cle clever like the Labour Party are in terms of the strategies f f for this issue in their manifesto is absolutely crucial because if it's yeah. done wrong, and then there's no there's no representation in the next government that's put forward this idea, that could be twenty years of work just being shot backwards, you know. But the very people. Sorry, Eric. Eric has to head off to something else. Can I tell you one thing, Nettle? I'll be definitely voting Labour the next time because I'm very for this 
Marty, I can also ask, work full time. Um, I work part time in Blanchestown and food shop, and that happened to me where I turned up one day and they said, "No, look, it's quiet. You're going to have to go home." And obviously that was through train fare and night, etc. But then I also worked the other way. Like we're in December, from up to Christmas, they expected me to work forty hours a week, and I was yeah. part time in college. And there's other people maybe you know whether it was childcare issues or whatever. And if you turn down those forty hours, that's you going yeah. off the roster. Mm -hmm. So like it works both ways. If they're not offering enough hours and you're in trouble financially, then if you turn around and you too many hours, mm -hmm. and you actually can't physically do them. And there's just absolutely unless you're in a trade union or whatever, there is absolutely no place to uh, to stand up on, on your own as a worker. And again it's no paid work and obviously it's not the issue of the living wage exactly, but the hours hand in hand with um, living wage and, and uh and four year con like full time contracts if necessary. Steady part time contracts if that's what you want. You might just want to work eight hours a week. If you're scheduled to work twenty hours a week, that's what you should be given four hours like this. So. For the sense of certainty, for sure. yeah, in every single way, you know, money in your pocket to just the quality of life you're going to have on a regular basis. And uh, Barry, um, just Ethel already touched on this that um, with procurement and with declaring uh, the state a minimum wage employee or anyone with minimum wage or a living wage, wage living wage employee. Wage. Sorry. Um, the problem is that I mean we've already signed up to procurement legislation in Europe. That means that that contracts have to be tendered out across the EU almost in several cases, whether public or private companies. And that really is being ruthlessly exploited for the lowest possible wages across the, the EU by companies that are that are capable of doing so. So we really actually do need to have an EU wide look at this to prevent sort of shopping for minimum wages and minimum conditions at the same time that we're looking for a living wage in Ireland and the EU to jump with all of the EU to, to stop it being the lowest common denominator market start, start being the EU. The EU, the public procurement directive has not been transposed into Irish legislation yet but it has to be transposed by April 2016. The government in March and April 2016 could have a real bearing on the transposition of the directive. And as I understand it, Patrick, like different countries have transposed it in different ways, some with very strong protections for workers. Lorraine had drawn attention to Scotland. As I understand it, in Scotland, almost all health contracts, pri privatised health contracts like care contracts, are dependent upon paying the living wage. I, I think that's right, Lorraine. And, and um, there are examples from England of rail contracts where the contractor has to pay the UK living wage. So it can be done. They've done it in other yeah, countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you put in through clauses and so yeah. on and things like that. Too. But it has to be done in a very sensible way. And mm -hmm. the, the, the experience in the past is when it comes to clauses or a social clause that we just haven't been very effective at putting them in. But there are ways of doing it in a, in a very above board effective legal way. Just, just uh, one or two more comments and we might bring it to an end then. Yeah, John, just one point about right. um, the role of agencies in this, recruitment agencies, which basically are a vehicle for avoiding um, proper employment rights. So, you know, a big employer, say Tesco or whoever, humans, a lot of them just outsource their, you know, pretty much core functions to a, a recruitment agency and avoid having to uh, be seen not to be a living wage employer, not you know they don't have their hands over it, but but it's a very it's a very um you know it's, it's, they're in a stranglehold really the employees they, they don't they are effectively Tesco employees but they they're not accounted for in that way, and the recruitment agencies like there is a directive there there's a European directive there that says equal treatment for agency workers but agency workers are not organised in the main. And I think well, that's there, really there, that depends with, with whichever, I actually worked for Hughes and I got taken on through an agency and it was very permanent, but the, there that depends on the employee themselves negotiating with the agency a fair wage for themselves, a lot depends on the employee very themselves do. and also on the agency you're dealing with, like I was with Alfred Marx and I came out with more than some of the other people that were working that went straight in without an agency interceding for them. And that made yeah. them very jealous, to be honest with you. Well, I suppose you know? it, it shows the role of agency, of recruitment agencies, in kind of uh, 
becoming a, 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 a player in the employment relationship, which is complicating, you know, how you introduce living wage. That's it. Corey, did you want to have another video? Okay. Um, is it okay if we wrap it up then? Yeah? Yes. Can I thank particularly Ethel Bookie for taking all the firing lines? Thank you. First off, I want to thank my colleagues who have been part of organising tonight uh, Kevin Humphreys, TV, Joe Costo, TV, Aon O'Reardon, and Tip Lee. Uh, Panel's here report who's here beside you. Thanks for coming out on what is a night that we should be sitting in on a call that is outside of this event. And uh, thanks very much. I hope it was worthwhile. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> okay, just I'm I'm just I'm just I'm just I'm just I'm just Hi, can I just ask, this was a public meeting, wasn't it? Yeah, why, why was there certain people outside not allowed in? Yeah, it, it, was, it was advertised as a public meeting, as far as I know. They told me that they were only letting 66 in the room, so first come, first serve. That's what I was told. But there's empty seats down there, so there wasn't, I there was no. That's what I was told. No, I just found I that strange. Yeah. yeah.